So starting this month, really, other than kind of skipping next weekend for the Youth Summit, um, I want to talk a little bit about the path of life. Um, I kind of talked, ended a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the idea of life Jesus tells us in John 10.10 10, that he came that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. So I actually spent a number of weeks kind of examining what does that mean? What does it mean to have life? And what does it mean to have it abundantly? And, you know, went through a lot of things that God talked about. Um, notice that he doesn't mean an abundance of stuff. That's not what God is really that interested in. Um, what he's talking about is an abundance of fruit of the Spirit, an abundance of a quiet and peaceable life, that that's the target for somebody who wants to live a godly life. Um, but I ended a couple weeks ago with the idea, kind of looking forward to this idea of the path, that a lot of the world has, and I, sp I think this is really kind of Western culture, you know, Europe and America, they have this kind of I think there's this mindset in much of our, our cultures that says, you know, hey, I'm gonna, I might go out when I'm young and I might, you know, just do crazy stuff. And, yeah, but I'm only 20. You know, what does that matter? Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I might go out and riot and create great, you know, damage. But, ah, you know, when I'm 30 or 40, that won't matter because, you know, no big deal. A lot of our society wants to be able to be able to put whatever behind them. They can do, make all kinds of mistakes and go, well, you can't hold that against me. I did that when I was young. I did that, you know, years ago. I've been forgiven. I've been whatever. And, and I think I highlighted in the movie, uh, The Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen. The movie starts off, the heroes of the movie are all in jail near the beginning of the movie because they're all thieves, liars, and uh, murderers. At the end of the movie, the people who had put them in jail are giving them a plane and calling them the heroes and giving them medals. And, and I think our societies like to think that's the way it work, life works. And it just isn't. Life doesn't work that way. You could be the hero with a medal and if you've committed murder, and if you've done things that are get you in jail, you might come back with a big medal of honor and get thrown in jail. Because that's the way life really works. That it isn't about doing one big, great, heroic thing in life that, that undoes everything you've done before. That it really is about walking a path, not about crossing it from time to time. Not on, you know, every once in a while you kind of get on the right path and, and do some really great thing and then kind of get going off somewhere else again. And, and we kind of crisscross the right path. That's not really what God's talking about when he's talking about a blessed path. It really is about what we regularly practice. You know, that's what walking in the light is about in 1 John chapter 1. He's not, he talks about it. Even though we're walking in the light, we may need forgiveness for sins. But it isn't because we are, you know, purposely walking in darkness. It's because even when we're walking in light, we may sin. But walking in light does not mean we occasionally cross goodness. And so the blessed path of life. We're going to kind of look at uh, Psalm 1 today and kind of start there. But I'm, I'm going to come, we're going to, I'm going to talk about this for a few weeks, uh, for this month anyway. Um, and I want to read, though, Psalm 16, verse 11. It's a psalm of David's. He said, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is actually quoted in Acts chapter 2 um, in, by Peter when he was preaching on Pentecost. This is the very end of the quotation from David. Um, the verses before this are clearly talking about the Lord, you know, and David, though, is, tells them, you make known to me the path of life. And I want you to think about it and kind of look at David as an example of what I was talking about. David is a man we are told has a man after God's own heart, the kind of heart that we should all 
try to attain to. And yet David reaped in his life tremendous suffering. A lot of it brought on by his own behavior. When he committed adultery with Bathsheba and covered it up by killing her husband, prophet finally comes to him, Nathan, and tells him, you know, and gets him to repent, but tells him that the sword will never leave your family. And so he has twice his children try to take over his throne. And his children, you know, die. He, some of them, you know, put to death by his own military men, which he didn't want done, but they do anyway. Probably deservedly so, but it's, you look at David and you go, well, here's this guy, you know, none of us can ever be David, and yet, even though he was called by God at a young age, anointed by God at a very young age, even though he, he did amazingly and wonderful things, the way that he ultimately treated his family caused his family to be a mess. And it caused tremendous pain and suffering for him, his family. God didn't take that away even though he was forgiven. Even though God saw his repentance and accepted him back, he didn't get rid of the things that he was going to reap. And that's what happens in life. That's the way life really works. That's, that's why the, the things that we do, what we sow on a regular basis is going to come back to us. If we sow peace, he says, we'll reap peace. But if we sow discord and if we sow, you know, difficulty and we're, you know, bad employees and we're bad spouse and we're a bad parent or we're a bad child, those things will come back to us. So if we want that blessed life, if we want to be able to live in a way that says, man, they're really blessed, then we have to walk a blessed path. It's just think about, I mean, I could kind of go over, about Moses. You look at Moses and you go, wow. And yet at the end, he still doesn't get to go into the promised land, does he? Because of what he had done. You think about thief on the cross, sitting there, you know, some, some Jewish man next to Jesus. And at one point in time, they were both ridiculing him. But at one point, one of those thieves says, you know, hey, recognizes he's the Lord and says, you know, hey, please forgive me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He got to see the eternity. He still had to suffer through the rest of being executed and hanging upon a cross until he was cut, until he, his legs were broken and he died on that cross. He still suffered that. God didn't take that away from him. And so we... We want our hearts and minds set on the end because that's where the real paradise comes, not here in this flesh and not in this world. But if we want to have some peace, some quietness, some goodness and joy, all those things, the fruit of the Spirit, then we have to walk the path, not just cross it from time to time. Now, what you think about... Here in Psalm chapter 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. By the way, the word for law, Torah, which is what the first five books of the Old Testament are called, the books of Moses, also means to instruct. That's what commands, that's what you know, commandments are about, instruction. And he's saying the man who walks this blessed path, his delight is in the instructions of God. He doesn't look at the instructions of God and say, oh, God's one of those fathers that just wants me to not have any fun. Every kid, every kid at one point or another has thought their parents were simply put on earth to, so they cannot have any fun. 
And a lot of people think that's what God's there for. And God's not there for that. He does give us, though, His laws. And I think last year I, I did a kind of series about this, but maybe the year before. His laws are not things that He prevents us from breaking. They are like a fence that's there as a boundary. Say, don't go beyond this. But it's low enough we can jump it. Because it says on the other side is trouble. And too often, though, we, we're tempted and desire those things on the other side, and so we jump over. Reminds me of that, that saying, you know, the grass is always greener, right? You know, it's like, why does their grass look so good? And then you go over and look at it up close, oh, not as good as I thought it was. But God has given us boundaries to show us where all of this goodness, righteousness, peace, and patience, and kindness, where does it dwell? Where does it come from? What do you need to sow to reap those things that are the fruit of the Spirit? And so it really comes from the instructions God has given us. Now, and God wants us, as John 10, 10 talked about, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. And he wasn't referring to life after you leave the world. He wants you to have it now all the way through eternity. But let's think about the things where he says it's not. It's actually exactly where I started when I said, what is life? What does God mean by he wants us to have life? And I went, you know, the easiest thing was to take all of the statements Jesus made, says here, it's not this and it's not that and it's not this. It's not food, it's not in clothing, it's not in possessions. Because it's one of those things that sometimes it's hard to define exactly what it is but when we find what it's not, I think it helps to narrow the focus a little. And so, first off, the blessed man who's walking this blessed path does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. <clears throat> so those people who are walking contrary to God, he doesn't sit and listen to them and go, well, that sounds good. Let's do that. Because that would obviously be a different path, wouldn't it? Not the blessed path. So think about a couple of, of, of verses. Jesus said in John 12, 35, The light is among you for a little while longer. We know he meant to himself. <clears throat> Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. But he gives us light even though he's not in our physical presence. And he says, you've got to walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. That actually is a little bit of a reference to an Old Testament teaching that the Israel ha Israelites were given. But he says, the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. And that's what people walking in the world are like. The smartest people in the world, too, are like this. Stumbling around, not really understanding why life doesn't work out the way they want it to all the time. Why they don't have peace why they don't have wonderful relationships, why they don't have wonderful families. You take, the, you take the brightest, smartest people in the world from a worldly perspective, and you, sometimes you look at their families, and what are they like? What is their personal family or personal life like? They're not things we want, we should envy. So, so often, we look at people like, movie stars and things, and they look like their life is just wonderful. They look like, oh, they've got, they've got everything. And yet, you, and who would have thought Robin Williams would have killed himself? The guy, every time you saw him publicly, he looked happy, right? He was miserable, obviously, for long, long periods of his life. He never received the help he ideally would have gotten. He was lost in a dark place. Why? And, and what happened to him can happen to those of us who know God, too. We, don't, we shouldn't be, don't deceive ourselves. And so, understanding that the people sometimes that look like they have it all, sometimes it's just a facade. 
In fact, more often than not, it's just a facade. The, the, the goodness and, and the richness and the, and the wonderfulness often doesn't really translate to the whole life. Sitting in their home, peaceful. How many of the wealthy you know, people sometimes sit in their homes and are incredibly lonely? Because one of the things about being rich and powerful is you don't always know who your friends are. You don't always know who's around you just because you're rich and you're powerful. And it's a very isolating experience. And so we look out into the world sometimes and the facades we see, we sometimes are, we sometimes are drawn to them. He says, don't, don't do that. You're going to end up walking around in the darkness. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 19, The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. That's what I was saying earlier. Sometimes they, 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 keep, they keep, oh, they've got their plans. They got, well, we'll do this and we'll do that and this. And then it doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work. One of the problems why life doesn't often work for those in the world is because they become enemies of God. God doesn't bring to prosperity those who are his enemies. Their end will not end well, even if it looks good in the world. Which is exactly the opposite, opposite of, of those who are with him, who walk with him, his, his family, his children. Now, Isaiah 59, I want to read this passage because I think it's a passage that Many of us are somewhat familiar with in the first couple of verses. So if I, you know, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. So that's probably a passage that many of us have heard before, because that's a really popular one. But it really isn't that one I want to focus on, because it's what going on from there. Because I was actually looking at a passage earlier, and I went, oh, this is all connected to that those verses. And he says, for your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. It doesn't always, it always amazes me. I met a, I met a young guy visiting the area here on Thursday. I, I was playing some golf in the morning and um, he was traveling here from California with his wife. Wife does kind of horse stuff as well, a horse show. Um, and we were talking, going as we were going on the day, I don't know, halfway through the round, you know, what do you do? Uh, you know, I'm a minister. And, you know, wife and I always kind of also do taxes and things. He goes, oh, I would hate to have my tax guy be a minister. Then I couldn't fudge the numbers. <laughs> well, most, most CPAs don't want to fudge numbers either. It's not worth their license. But uh, he said, but the, the concept, you know, he seemed like a nice, decent guy, but, you know, the, the idea that, the, in the world, those who don't really follow that, turns out he kind of was raised in a ba pretty devout Baptist uh, church family. Um, he doesn't really go, but we, could all, we talked a lot about religion for quite a while. But um, people, I think, in the world are always stunned that their dishonesty in, in some little area, like on a tax return with, for that evil government, and then they're shocked when other people are not honest with them. So much that people are dishonest, and yet, surprise, other people are dishonest back. As if, as if we, all, we compartment, well, I'm only dishonest here. I will only do it to the evil federal government or state government, whichever you hate more. And we think somehow that that iniquity stops there. Well, okay, but yeah, beyond that, I'm... But think about what that says. You know... Now, I don't think I know that every child figures out their parents are lying on their tax return, and lots of people do. But they do see honesty or not. Little things like, you know, answering, or we don't really have to answer the phone for anybody else anymore, do we? But it's like, oh, you know, tell them I'm not here. I can remember that being a kid, you know, one phone in the house, you know, tell them I'm not here. So you can lie when it's convenient. Those concepts, they, they play out in our relationships. 
the dishonesty, the, the, the way that we act, it affects our lives. Now, he goes on, um, no one enters suit justly, no one goes to law honestly. Think about what they say, you, you're, in a, you're in a legal court. Now, we probably have a, their system of, of justice is a little different uh, than ours is. We kind of understand that both sides are only saying the things that help their case and don't say the things that don't help their case. They're not really searching for truth. It, we have a kind of a, a conceptual that two sides each kind of battling for their own version of the truth and then, the, you know, a jury that tries to figure it out. Well, in the ancient world, they didn't really have that. Everybody had to, similar, I think, still in Europe today, that they're supposed to try to find the truth. What's, what's the truth? But when people go to court, are they, are they interested in what's the truth or what wins it for them? <laughs> and that's what he's saying. So often in the world, that's what people are interested in. Not what's true, not what's honest. And so, um, he says, they rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, they conceive mischief, give birth to iniquity, hatch adder's eggs, weave spider's web, they eat their eggs, he who eats their eggs dies, and from one that is crushed a viper is hatched, their webs will not serve as clothing, men will not cover themselves with what they make, their works are works of iniquity and deeds of violence are in their hands, their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. I you know, I always love, too, in the world, I really, I think, I don't know if this is just something I've been noticing a lot recently. We are in a time where people are abhorring physical violence. And, and for good cause, I mean, it should be. But we completely ignore the violence we do with our tongues. And we forget it. It's like, all oh, that. well, that's just words. It doesn't matter. Not true. Like scriptures even talk about how what what gossip really is. It's violence being done with the mouth. But oh, well, that doesn't matter. It's just it's just words. Words actually, as God tells us, are have both death and life in them. But we don't often think about in those ways people that people a lot of people don't think they're violent who are really violent they're not not be physically violent but they breed violence they they cause violence they they incite violence and so he goes on there uh, the way of peace they do not know well I skip verse 7 they, their feet run to evil they are swift to shed innocent blood their thoughts our thoughts of iniquity, desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. This is the exact opposite of what God's talking about. If you want peace, you've got to walk the path of peace. He says, therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. And they, they want the hope, they want the goodness, and they don't get it and don't understand why. He says, therefore, well, he goes, we grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight among those in full vigor who are like dead men. And they don't understand it. They think they see. It's exactly like the, the, the leaders, uh, the Pharisees, the things that Jesus was talking about in his day, that they were blind, and they go, you're calling us blind? Well, you say you see. <laughs> but they were blind. They were the blind leading the blind, and they were, they were smart, oftentimes. Yeah, the second point he makes there about uh, in Psalm 1, 1 and 2 is we don't stand in the way of sinners. So we don't listen to the... We need, we need to not listen to the advice of those who are walking the way of the world. And the second thing is don't stand in the way of sinners. Think, I want you to think about that, that image. So we don't walk the way they've kind of advised us to. The other thing is we don't stand on the path. So the sinners, here's their path. 
And we stand right there. Well, I'm not walking with them. I'm just standing there watching them. Just standing there kind of right next to them. And he says, don't stand in their way. Don't stand in that path. Proverbs chapter 1, 10 through 19 uh, the book of Proverbs actually has a very similar, a lot, a lot of passage, a lot of chapters in the early part that mirror Psalm 1 to, to a great degree. But starting in verse 10 there of Proverbs 1, he said, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, Come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Let Sheol, let us swallow them alive, or like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. For their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Think about this whole, how, how did the sinners entice them? Because their feet were there in their path. They may not have been running with them yet, but they were kind of, come, 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 but they were right there with them. He says, for in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. In Psalm 119, verses 101, author there said, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. So here's the evil path. I keep away from that evil path. I don't go stand in that evil path. The idea of a way and the idea of a path. In fact, you see how often Jesus says, I am the way. That's a path. Hebrews talks about how he opened up a way, a path to God. And he is kind of the... the author and finisher of that path, by the way, the book of Hebrews talks about. That's the path we need to find. That's the path we need to stand, and that's the path we need to walk. The third thing he tells us is, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, Psalm 26, verse 4 and 5, Do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. That's what he's talking about here, that I'm, I'm consorting with them. I'm planning with them. I'm sitting down. The concept of sitting with them is we're sitting and planning together. You've got to not do that. You've got to avoid that. And so, he talk, and so the idea of scoffers, though, uh, Proverbs chapter 1, continuing on actually from what I had just read, uh, starting in verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the market she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you, return, if you turn at my reproof, Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you because I have called you. I have called and you refuse to listen. I have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I will laugh at your calamity. Now, we don't often think about this, do we, about God? The concept of wisdom, laughing at those who are falling? You say... I was there. I was kept calling you, and you, you just said you hated it. You didn't want it, and then you went and fell, and I'm going to stand back and watch, and I'm going to laugh. That's what wisdom is saying. It sounds harsh, and it's kind of what it's intended to be. But he says, um, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Would have none of my counsel and despise all my reproof, therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way. What you practice, what these verses exactly what it says in the New Testament as well, what you reap, 
The path you walk is the fruit you're going to eat. He says, and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. Whoever listens to me will dwell secure, will be at ease without dread of disaster. If you listen to me, it won't, it won't be like that. You'll kind of know that's trouble. Don't head that way. Now think about the, what is a scoffer? I actually kind of looked up the word a little bit. The scorner, some translations use, or scoffer, this translation uses, is proud and haughty, so kind of arrogant, delights in scorning, is incapable of discipline, so rebellious, right? Stubborn, stiff-necked, incapable of reproof. So you can't, you can't really correct them. You can't rebuke them, and they don't find wisdom. They keep stumbling. They keep learning. You'd think, well, they're learning their lessons, right? How many times have you seen people who, who just keep doing the same stupid stuff over and over again and keep expecting different results? You know, the world calls that you know, insanity. The Bible calls that that's somebody who's really a scoffer. That's somebody who doesn't want God. They're going to keep stumbling and not really ever learning the lessons. Because the blessed path is one that starts with the fear of the Lord, starts with listening to God, starts with, I don't really know how to do this myself. Because if I do it my way, I'm going to stumble in the darkness just like everybody else. And so the blessed path is one that listens to, the, to wisdom. That's why one of the best things, and, and, I, and I've kind of been there myself, heard others, you know, kind of young people say it, you know, well, I, I just have to learn the lesson, I just have to learn the lesson myself the hard way. I, I just can't, don't, don't learn the lessons from other people. I've heard young people, I've heard young Christians say that. That is anti-wisdom. If you accept that about yourself, you are saying, I am not going to be wise. Because God says wisdom is listening to others help us see things before we have actually do them. Don't fall into that trap of this is the way I am. I just have to learn the lesson on my own. I can't listen to others and the mistakes they make. You're, you're kind of falling into this scoffer mode. You're falling into the trap of saying, well, I'm not going to learn my lesson until I do it myself. So, yeah, you know, my, my sister Susie stuck her you know, finger in that outlet and, you know, she got a shock, but I'll, I'm going to try it too. That's not wisdom. God's telling us to listen to wisdom. That's why he gives us so much of the people who have lived and so much of their wisdom and, tell, and tells us to listen to those who are, who are older who have gone through things, who have learned lessons, both the hard way and from others. Look around us. Don't be scoffers. Don't sit with them. Don't be like them. So the blessed path leads to prosperity. Psalm 1.3 there. He's like a tree. So this is what he tells you. You walk that blessed path. You, you listen to the law of the Lord. You don't walk in the way of the ungodly or, or listen to their counsel or stand in their paths or, or sit with them and, and you know, consort. He says, the person who does that is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The idea of prosper, by the way, as we've talked about in life, doesn't mean an abundance of stuff. Sometimes I always kind of want to put that out because, you know, talk about prosperity. So many people have kind of, so many people who have been trying to, like, read the Bible get caught up in the concept of God wanting people to prosper, thinking, well, that means a lot of stuff. And it doesn't mean, God doesn't mean a lot of stuff. Prosperity, you can have stuff or not have stuff and still be godly. <laughs> stuff is, not, is neither here nor there. But he says, like Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. 
He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, does not fear when heat comes. I think about these passages, by the way, every time I go by the Boise River. Walk by it, or you see all those trees now. This river, this, this year has been a little tough for those trees right by the edge with all the, the flooding. But you look at them, they all have lots of water, don't they? You can see where the river goes. Why, why this boy, why here in the middle of the desert, a city got the name, the city of trees, because the people coming across the, you know, uh, Oregon Trail saw a whole bunch of trees in the middle of shrubs and went, a oh, bunch of water down there. The Boise River, surrounded by all kinds of trees that feed it. The image, they would have had similar kinds of images around there in their areas as well, that they would have understood this. That's what God's trying to get them to see. That's what God's like. That's what we're like. We've got that river of life, is what he talked about. But he says, we don't have to fear when the heat comes, its leaves remain green, it's not anxious in the year of drought, does not cease to bear fruit. No matter when difficult times come, he says, if we, if we really walk this path all the time, we won't stop bearing fruit. We won't stop having love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all of those things are wrapped up in the path. They're all part of the river of life that God gives to us. Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His way. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. So to just kind of wrap up here this morning, if we walk the blessed path, don't just cross it from time to time. He tells us we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to bear good fruit. And that's what he's talking about. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. This is the kinds of things we want, right? People who are trustworthy are drawn to trustworthy people. That's what the idea of faithfulness is here. So we want to be trustworthy people. And, and then the people who are more trustworthy are more likely to be near us. If we're untrustworthy, then we're going to tend, tend to have people who are untrustworthy around us. We will walk properly and eat from our labor. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 12. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you brothers to do this more and more. To aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. To quiet, productive lives. He doesn't mean silent. He, he means it really has the idea of being peaceful and contented. And think about the concept of aspiring to a quiet life. It almost sounds, from the world's perspective, well, that's really weird. Nobody aspires to be nobody and live in quietness. You aspire to be somebody and be great and known, and that's what people aspire to. And God's saying, don't aspire to that worldly stuff. Aspire to, to live and work and be productive in your life and have all that peace and patience and kindness. That's what you need to make as your target for your life and for your path. That is the path of, that he's talking about being blessed. 